Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, it's first Sunday of the year, and it's now 2 p.m. in the UK, um, 10 p.m. in Manila, and whatever time it is, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the first episode of Ask the Jama um in 2022 oh my god 2022 <laughs> um, this first episode it's actually it's an incredible start to um the year because my guest um today he's so amazing i mean i don't really i didn't get to know him um until last august when i went to preston pop fest but he's really incredible so um i'm gonna bring him in now um, so please let's all welcome Richie Dempsey. Hi, hey, how's it going? Hello, yeah. hi, Richie. All right. well, yeah, I, have to, I, I have to say, so like, um, up until August of last year, I actually had no idea who you are. <laughs> just <laughs> but um when I was sort of like doing the script for today, mm -hmm. it's just incredible what I've found out about you. So we're gonna talk about that today. <laughs> um but do you wanna just say hello to everyone first? Yeah, hi everybody. I uh, hope you had a really nice Christmas and a brilliant new year. I hope you've all sobered up. I certainly have. Um, and uh, I hope it's going to be not as bad as the last couple of years. I'm not overly optimistic, but we never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to say Happy New Year to you first. It was all like, I've got in my script, I've forgotten about it, so Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah. Happy New Year to you. <laughs> yeah. we, we've already got a friend, so like, um, wanting to say hello to you as well. We've got wow. W. Frederick, who's in um, California. Right. So, happy, yeah, Happy New Year, Anne and Richie. Have a good chat. Um, my husband is actually always, you know, he's always all like watching. Aiden, yeah. Aiden O'Rourke, sound and vision looking excellent, he said. And um, Monty Mendigoria, who's in Manila, um, he's also watching us and saying hello. Happy New Year, Anna and Richie. Monty's got, yeah. Monty's got an, a podcast, which I actually saw, like, based this as the drummer from. Um, oh. But he, he talks to, like, um new wave musicians mm -hmm. so it's called it's all about new wave and because in the philippines oh, yeah, yeah we're, we're really into new wave so <laughs> so oh, hello everyone so <laughs> um did you have a good christmas and new year celebration? I, I, it was pretty good i mean it was it was pretty quiet it was like me and my wife and my daughter my daughter's uh six um you know physically mentally she's like you know 16 you know what I mean? She's a, a bit of a rancor, you know what I mean? So I, but she had a good Christmas. It was, it was quiet. She's the three of us, you know, and um, yeah. it was, I, she was getting really excited about loads of stuff. So I was kind of getting her to go to bed at night. It was just an absolute nightmare, you know what I mean? So she's kind of stayed up yeah. the same time as us, you know. So well, it was, you know, so it was pretty good. Well, well, just, well, you know? <laughs> did you have fireworks on the Year's Eve? Or? Uh, New Year's Eve, we stayed in as well. Um, yeah. Stayed up till about. Uh, the, the the Sarah and Eva went to bed about 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 one o'clock in the morning, and I sat up um, on YouTube drinking wine myself, uh, watching loads and loads of Genesis videos and uh, slagging off other Genesis fans that were slagging off Genesis. <laughs> it, was, it was one of those nights. I woke up the next morning like, oh no. <laughs> 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 well, one of the things I've missed about um, Manila is like New Year celebrations there. It's always like loud, you know, with fireworks yeah. and everything. But here we normally just have a quiet night in. <laughs> so yeah. like, oh, yeah, watch, it, watch the telly and stuff. So. <laughs> well, I, I did notice that because there was no like street celebrations and stuff. Well, they never really is in Glasgow, do you know what I mean? They have it in Edinburgh, but I noticed there was a lot of people, there was a lot of noise in the street. Where I live is very yeah. quiet. But when it was like about five to twelve, started fireworks started going off, and then it started like I mean, you never saw anything; you could hear it, you know. But yeah, yeah, loads, loads of parties going on and stuff like that, you know, with like windows open, so it was kind of like they were doing the right thing, you know, kind of yeah. keep it all ventilated and stuff like that. But it sounded like <laughs> having a good time, so you know. <laughs> well, yeah, um, yeah, I've actually want to dedicate this episode to Chris, Chris Quinn of the Orchids, because oh yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank him for the introduction. It was him 
who um when I posted your video of really? um some shapes of during Preston Park, right. um Chris Gwynn sort of like commented, When are you going to get Richie Dempsey on us? <laughs> I'm sure, like, and I was sort of like thinking, Oh my god, I don't even know his name. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny actually. I, I did a gig in um, a band about two, it was just about three or four months before lockdown. Well, maybe yeah. before that, actually, and it was supporting the Orchids. It was a band called Smack Van, right? And they're really good, but they're really slow and really quiet. Yeah, and I'm yeah. really loud and really fast. So I had to kind of relearn how to do that kind of thing. <laughs> so I actually used Chris's, I, I phoned Chris and I got a hold of him and was like, eh, I don't, I've never met you before. I think we actually maybe even just messaged each other. I was like, we've never met each other before, but I'm supporting you tonight. Is there any chance I can just use all your drums? You know, quite. Unfair, <laughs> and I says, I don't, I don't, mate, I won't touch a thing. I'm just going to come in and sit there. And she was dead high and all that, but but I was just like kind of hunched over. I was like, right, but I, I promised that I wouldn't, I wouldn't move it. And yeah. stuff, I promise. But it was a brilliant gig, though. But I mean, it was, it was. Uh, uh, the orchids were great that night. It was first time, weirdly enough, the, the only time I've ever seen them. But it was yeah, a brilliant, yeah. really good. Well, time. Smack fan, I remember that name because I think they supported the orchids. Is it? The, oh, the Glasgow? Is it? That was a gig. That was That's a gig. The, so you, it was you then. Oh, oh, I, I, I was up one night and Michael for, um, uh, for Smack Van sent me a message and he was like, oh, we've got this gig at audio and their drummer can't make it, he's going holiday, can you do it? You know, and I was like, a bottle of wine oh, down. I I, I'll be able to do that, that'll be fine. <laughs> and then it was like, this will not happen. And then he's like, oh, this is, we're, we're rehearsing next week, can you come in? And I was like, oh man, we do this now. <sighs> but I really enjoyed it though, it was brilliant. It was really yeah. good fun because it was, it was quite out, way out, out of my comfort zone. Because I had to play really, just like really under. Do you know what I mean? Well, I've got it's to really like, crazy. yeah, I've got to look for the photos of that uh, gig and maybe videos as well. Because I normally saw like video, um, even support and also yeah. take photos of the job. So I might probably have seen you before, <laughs> first of all. But any, but anyways, um, right. So first time I saw you, um, in some shapes that was. I was like in uh, Preston Park last August. And I'm really glad that I went there because you opened the festival, mm. the open music event. And what an opener that was. It was just incredible. It was like... we, we, nearly never, we nearly never made it. I mean, it took us six hours to get to Preston for Glasgow. That's usually about three hours. But the M6 was a total car park that day. So basically, we're just like trundling along. And yeah. um, we just got in at uh, five past six. And Rico was like, we can get you on at half past six. I was like, ah, that's totally cool. So, but the weird thing was we were coming out of the van and Alan Brown was coming out. Alan Brown from Great, Great Leap Forward and Big Flame, right? He was coming out. Oh, yeah, he, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. He was effectively roading for us that, that night for about five minutes because he was helping us in, in and out with the gear. <laughs> and I was just like, this is just mental. This is a guy, the guy who's banned my entire life in 1985. Do you know what I mean? He's like carrying all our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so the fanboy, but we just—I mean, the thing was, we just went on, and we played, and we never even had a chance to get nervous about it, and, we, and we realized at that point, I was just like, oh, "This is really good. This is kind of fun." And then three guys come up to us at the end of it, and just before I met you, actually, and they were like, "That was brilliant. You're the first band we've seen in 18 months." And I was like, "Surely not." And then I looked around, and I was like, "Man, you haven't played in two years." And that is the first gig for probably a lot of people in 18 months. It was like, and then I started to get nervous about it. I was like, God, I hope we weren't rubbish. I mean, but it was, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty amazing. It was, it was great. It was really, really good. A really good day. I had to go home the next day. I missed the Wolf Hounds. But um, I, I love being there. It was brilliant. Loads of, loads of good feeling in the room. Loads of really cool Yeah, guys. yeah, loads, yeah. Loads, oh, that loads, was amazing. You know, that was really was good. Good for it as well, you know, so. But uh, it was it was nice, you know, a really nice day. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to Ask the Drummer. Um, episode twenty one is all about you, Richie Dempsey. <laughs> so <laughs> we're gonna. <laughs> as, <laughs> well, as you, well, no, I was telling to you, I was telling you earlier that this script that I did last night it was actually. It was the longest so far. Because <laughs> it was just so fascinating. Really? But it was, um, yeah, as usual, we'll start from the very beginning. The very so, um, <laughs> so um, were you born in Glasgow? Yeah, born in Glasgow in 1969. 
Right, same year as me, which is really hey. good. So hey. it's like, hey, 1969, baby. It's like David Chambers of uh, uh, you know, David. Hey, hey, it's hey, also hey, 1969. So, hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but um, so um, what was Glasgow um like when you were growing up? Because I know that the um, Liverpool and Manchester, they're mm-hmm. like you know, the music um capitals of. Yeah, but not just the UK, maybe the world, because you know there's so many bands and artists from Liverpool and Manchester. But Glasgow is also another place where you produce so many so like amazing um, bands and musicians and artists. So what was it like for you when you were growing up in in Glasgow? Music I, mean, scene, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I moved out. I moved out of Glasgow um, when I was about six and moved to a place called Erskine. Uh, it's only like 40 miles away, but it takes you like, feels like months to get into town, do you know what I mean? The buses are really slow. And But anyway, I, you'd always hang out in Glasgow. And I suppose like when I was about maybe about 13, 14, I was kicking about the town quite a lot. And I was getting really into buying records and stuff. So you kind of yeah. like, I, I was too young to go to gigs at the time. But when I was about 15, I started going to Splash One. And that's when I saw Big Flame. You know, and there was they had a brilliant support band called the Mackenzies, and they were they were they were a Glasgow band, um, yeah, and that was, was getting fun enough actually as well, supporting Big Flame, and that night just completely blew the top of my head right off. It was absolutely brilliant. Up to that point, I was really into Simple Minds, like Simple Minds were really the first band that kind of moved me, as it, as it were, were, like you know, yeah, yeah, serious, like you know, I want to know more about this and get into, into that kind of thing, you know, but um, and it was like the Jesus Mary chain and. You know, that, that was good and you know it, it was they were they were like our sex pistols you know because of our kind of like attitude and all that kind of thing you know <laughs> yeah. maybe not a fair analogy you know what i mean but it was that way where when we, when i was at school and i saw them on the old gray whistle test and they did uh, in a hole and they were just dead sort of like hitting drums like that and no care yeah is that Bobby Gillespie? There was it Aye. Bobby Gillespie doing that oh my god i love Bobby Gillespie <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good guy. But, um, no, I, so I mean, that was, I mean, there, there's tons and tons of bands getting to be glad, like Soup Dragons as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Aztec Camera? Aztec Camera. Aztec Camera, yeah, they were really, I never got to see Aztec Camera. They were slightly before I got to go to see gigs and stuff like that. So I missed the whole postcard thing, you know? Right, okay. And there was there was always millions of bands kicking around. There was always tons of venues and stuff like that as well, you know, there was loads and loads of bands. It was brilliant, you know. I mean, you could actually get to see, you could go to gigs pretty much every night, you know. And it's funny now that that you can't go to gigs every night, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take it for granted, then you know there was just bands playing all the time, you know. Yeah. Well, lucky because you're here, you're in the UK. I mean, Um, it's it's one of those things that was all like, I wish I was already living here because for us in Manila or in the Philippines, especially so, like maybe not some people but in my case you know i never really went to any gigs in, no. in Manila, which is it was difficult for me because i wasn't even allowed to go out at night anyway so i mean it took a lot of convincing for my mom to let me go to my first ever gig you know my yeah. first ever gig was um depressed mode at the barrelands in 1984 and it was oh. I mean, totally brilliant it was like the some great reward tour I, it was just because yeah, yeah. you know, this is a band that I'd seen in Top of the Pops, and I had some other records, and I wasn't going to go see them, you know. And uh, and I was just, it was like there they are, they're right there. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, was, yeah, in front of you. Was, <laughs> so I mean, after that, just going to see, and then then I just started going to see bands like like you know like Big Flame and uh, Fire Hose and just anything that did the membranes, yeah, and Astros, yeah. you know, just loads yeah, of stuff. But- it was a really good place. I don't know if anybody spoke to you about Splash One before. There was a club in Glasgow. No, no, not, no. I no, was well. actually doing the door at Splash One. It was that sort of like a similar to, say, his, the Hacienda or Eric's. Is that a similar thing? Or? No, I mean, it was, it was basically like, it was a psychedelic punk rock soundtrack. That's what it said it was, right? And basically, oh, right. it was a nightclub, right? It's not there anymore. The, the, the building got burnt down and then they built up another thing because it's one of these horrible pubs. But um, but it was basically a nightclub that was like really kind of, it was a bit of yeah, a fancy kind of nightclub in the 80s kind of thing. So on a Sunday night, every second Sunday, they would have these, there were two bands playing and then they would play tapes. 
like the guys that put the gigs on uh, just made up compilation tapes and just people got into it, you know. And it was all stuff like the Seeds and the Velvet Underground and the Fire Engines and Joseph K and, you know, I thank God wow. that. You know, just loads, loads and loads and loads of really good music that I never knew. I mean, the first time I ever danced up there was to this brilliant song. I didn't know what it was. And then me and my mate were dancing. And I was like, what is that? This was like Pink Floyd. Don't let anybody tell you they were always <laughs> like, What? This is amazing. It was Lucifer Sam, right? <laughs> I, mean, I like Pink Floyd more now than I did then, you know what I mean? But it was like, wow, this is totally opened the door, you know? And then yeah, there's yeah. millions and millions of bands. And there was loads of bands we kick about there. Like, you know, the BMX Bandits and Sean for the Soup Dragons was always there and stuff like that, you know? And, so it was great, and you got to kind of hang out with these people that had made records, and people that had yeah, actually okay. made were really important to me, you know, because it was like all I ever wanted to do was get a record out. You yeah. know? All right. <laughs> Doesn't change it at all. <laughs> well, I've got to ask: um, Have you always been into drumming, or what got you into drumming? Always been. Into, always. I tried a few other things: tried trumpet, tried piano, tried bass. Didn't work. Just drumming, yeah. really. Um, uh, but I, I mean, I used to have a tape of me when I was four playing drums. Well, I used to have like a little kind of tiny me drum set, you know, like yeah, uh, yeah. tiny me plastic red drumsticks. And mom and dad got me them. And um, I was drumming along to, I was, my brothers were really into prog rock. And my, one of my brothers brought home an album by a band called Beggar's Opera, who were a, a prog rock band from Oregon just up the road. And there was one song on that record that I really loved, so I learned it, right? Um, and just tried, like, you know, like playing the guitar, like, gee, 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 like that kind of thing, and just drumming along that <laughs> thing. So I've got, I used to have this cassette of me uh, drumming, what? playing, yeah, yeah, yeah. and singing, right? And then it got played at my 30th birthday. Like, an ex girlfriend of mine had a really good 30th birthday party for me up at Party Thistle's Ground, and she had that tape and she put it on, and we forgot to pick it up and we get lost. So I don't have it anymore. But, um, oh, no. I don't know that story, <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I, so basically, when I was about three or four, I was really into yeah. drumming. Really liked um, like uh, like ELO, uh, Bed Bevan, and uh, a Dutch band called Solution. Because I, I got I got all my, my influences from my brothers. Um, they they were really into Jethro Tull and uh, Beggars Opera, as I say, and all these kind of uh, Finnish and Dutch. Yeah rock rock and sort of jazz fusion bands and all that kind of, you know. So I kind of got right into all that, you know, and so that's, I, I mean, I was never anywhere, I could never play like that, but I liked yeah. it, you know, and it kind of, I got, I just found it a lot more interesting, do you know what I mean? And I just well, liked things. <laughs> well, you're talking about prog rock, because um, David Chambers, um, he's actually said that, I, don't forget to ask you or <laughs> quiz you about your prog influences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, well, this is sort of like something different. But I don't know if you're aware that Rick Astley was actually a drummer. Is he? Did you know that? I didn't know that. Uh, he well, he is a drummer. Um, or he was a drummer when he started. Um, in a band called. Um, FBI, it's like a local Newton Lorillos. He's from Newton Lorillos of in Lancashire. Right, and he, aye, aye. yeah, and he played drums for that for a band called FBI. And he, I remember him saying that his um, influence is actually prog rock as well, because yeah, um, right. his sister, his sister is very much into um, uh, prog, prog rock music, and so that's what you know. That's what he was so like. I didn't know that. By that one. Yeah, yeah. And that so I, remember, I didn't realize he was that cool. That's brilliant. I know. <laughs> I know. Right out there, my estimations now. Right. <laughs> I saw him play um, Highway to Hell. I've actually recorded it. And I was so like, from that moment on, I was so like thinking, God, I love him as a drummer. Yeah. I love him more as a drummer now. That's <laughs> <amazing. laughs> Right. Anyways, yeah, there you go. So, um, right, um, back to let's let's go back to your drumming career. I'm sort of like thinking of Rick Astley not playing Highway Too Well, but I was like, um, <laughs> yeah, um, oh, I've got a question here by the way from W. Frederick, who's in California. He said, um, what characteristics make up a good drummer? <laughs> One, <laughs> um, I think you've just got to be open, 
open to ideas. Do you know what I mean? Um, and relaxed. And just, I don't know. I think you need to get on with people with being a drummer. I mean, you know, you have to kind of, there's just so many different things. Uh, different Maybe just things be personal. cool or something. Because drummers are so cool, aren't they? You've What's got to be thing? cool. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> like I just think that they're like the coolest member of any band. Is like, I always sort of like see them as it's just sort of like they're at the back just. <laughs> a guitarist can drop a note, right? And you know, no. <laughs> I drop a stick, game's up. You know what I mean? That's it. I, I was doing a gig at the Barrowland one time with an acid jazz band that you probably don't know about, right? But we're supporting um, the James Taylor Quartet. And I remember, because it's a dance band, so everybody's, you know, they're no dancing to the, you know, the guitar. It's the, it's the drums that they're going for, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so I just, I slip, a stick slipped out of my hand and it was like, like that. It was in slow motion. It felt like it was like taking about 20 minutes to hit the ground. And I don't know how I retrieved it, but I managed to do it and I didn't drop a beat. And it's probably one of the most amazing things I've ever had to do. <laughs> because <laughs> you know, there was about 2,000 people at this gig and they were all having a good time, as I can see. But it was, yeah. um, I mean, you've... Uh, I we, we we make mistakes. Everybody knows about it. Do you know what I mean? So so it's kind of it's it's a tough one. It's like really the, the goalie, you know, of the team. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyways, um, I'm like, I'm gonna ask you about your drumming disasters later on. So <laughs> it's like you can tell me more about that later. But um, I'm gonna start like asking you, what was your first band as a drummer? First band. Yeah. yeah. I had loads of first bands because I mean we all <laughs> the first band. did it five bands in the same same week. Um, well, the first gig I did, I think, was um, is it Totty Boggle or something? I saw it on your face. No, 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 <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> no, yeah, right, no, Totty Boggle was right, was basically I was they, they were a bunch of guys, they're good guys, not. But they, it was another one of those, their drummer couldn't make it. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. You know, I mean, yeah, I just yeah. came in and did it. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's <laughs> I've been getting a hard time from it ever since. I can't even remember anything about the gig. I just remember I was sitting behind the drum kit playing songs yeah. probably way faster than they should have been. Do you know what I mean? But well, I, I Googled it. I Googled it. And I and according to Google, Totty Boggle means scarecrow? In Aye, I think it does. Aye, I think it does. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I don't know because I thought, if I, oh, I'll, I'll put this in. I'll Google this name, Toti Boggle. But it came like Scarecrow in Scotland. So right. I put in Toti Boggle Band. <laughs> it didn't bring up anything. No, I mean, I don't think they did much. I think they did maybe like two or three. Oh, they did more than that, actually. But with me, I only did one show with them. Um, but there were these guys, the guys that were kicking about Glasgow quite a lot. All just said, I mean, everybody knew each other, do you know what I mean? So it's, so it's pretty cool. But I think I think the first band might have been the Hurricane Sound, if I'm right. I don't know. Um, and our first gig was, our first of our two gigs that we did, was at the Hatton Rick Hotel, supporting the Suit Dragons, the BMX Bandits, I think it might have been their first gig, and a band called Gods for All Occasions, who had Ross... The original drummer from T uh, from uh, Suit Dragons playing Suit guitar. Dragons, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I that that was great, but that was I had to take the afternoon off school to go and do that gig in Bells Hill, and it was Hatton Rig was quite a legendary place place um, uh, for for gigs in the bad times, like eighty five, eighty six, I think, um, yeah. and it was it was really good. But the weird thing about it was I was up there, I was playing, and I was so into it. It was like, man, this is amazing. This is like I've always wanted to do this. And I looked round and everybody was talking during the songs and I was just like, nobody cares. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like, like this is what it's like to be first on. But it didn't bother me because it was dead good. Because when I looked out in the crowd, there was all people like, um, like Sean, obviously all the bands that were playing over there. And I think there was like, uh, Norman Blake was there and uh, the, the Eugene Kelly for the Vaselines and stuff like that. They were all there as well. So it was a bit of a kind of a hodgepodge. Jim, Jim McDonald? Jim McDonald was there? Hi, Jim. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Hello there. Hi. I know. He's lovely. He's like so a lovely man. He's, all... he's a brilliant guy, isn't he? He's a really good guy. He's actually, it's nice to see him on the internet. Really. But um, no, I think that might have been the first, the first band. Might have been. Might have been. I don't know. But it was well, a while ago. 
there's something that um I read. Oh, you've sort of like um hello, hello. Yeah, you're still there. Yeah, there's something that I read on your um sort of like Facebook page that again from this totally bog wall. <laughs> um, <laughs> that um this supposed to sort of like well, there's an hour supposed to like an hour set that you only did in half an hour because you were playing so fast. <laughs> Currently, which I could understand because after seeing you at Preston Park, you're just so powerful and so like fast. Like, <laughs> so can you tell us more? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I know. I think that was. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do play a wee bit too fast, and it is <laughs> you know, adrenaline more than anything else. Do you know what I mean? And I'm really enjoying it. You know, but sometimes I'm listening back to live tapes. I'm just like, nah, that's way too fast, man. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> but, but I think you know, it, you know what? See if it's fun at the time. That's fine. Do you know what I mean? I never use click tracks or anything like that. You know, I've always been a bit more of the kind of. I've never really had to use click tracks. I quite like to fancy it. I quite like to fancy it. I quite fancy trying it actually. But um, nah, I just kind of go with it. You know, just play with the band as. As the band, and yeah, I mean, that, that, it was Pete that, 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 that wrote that down actually. He was the guitarist in the, the Tatty Bogles. And I can't believe we're talking about the Tatty Bogles all the time. It's been like, oh, did one gig. The conversation's longer than the gig. <laughs> well, I want to say hello to Guy Keegan. Guy Keegan is the drummer of um, the Railway Children. Do you remember oh, that? Great, from man. Wigan, yeah. He says, yeah, I yeah. am Richie, Happy New Year. Um, yeah. So, um, again, from your Facebook page, because I'm not a stalker on this, but it's just that, you know, when you um, share the um, guest announcement post, so, so like, I've got to read, just in case there are people asking questions there. Yeah, but, sure. Um, yeah, I've read, uh, someone sort of like said that, this is not a drumming now, but it's like you were a guest, and um, a ground announcer? Was <laughs> I was all yeah. like, a bit confused. I was all like, what is a ground announcer? Ground announcer, right, okay. Well, ground announcer is basically, what, what it was is um, I had to read, well, basically, Partick Thistle's the football team I support, right? And I met one of the guys for the office, because I used to go up and do the, the lottery up there, so I knew the guys, yeah. or the people, people that worked in the office and that. So anyway, um, I met, I was at the football one night, and one of the guys turned around to me in the concourse, and he's oh, you're in the music business, aren't you? And I'm like, aye. And he's like, all oh, right, okay, cool. Because we need a guy to read out the football teams. You'll be able to do that, right? And I was like, that's got nothing to do with the music business, man. Nothing to do with drumming or doing sound directing. I told my mates about it, and they were like, you need to do it, man. That'll be brilliant. You'd be the grounder and stuff for Thistle. That'll be the best job ever. And I was like, all right. So I went along and done it, and um, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely hated it. Because uh, it was dead nerve-wracking, you know what I mean? To like... To like to read out the teams, and the first thing I had to read it was like somebody scoring against my own team, you know. And it was like, I don't like this much, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't want to get used to that. So, yeah, I mean, I did have to, I did, had to read, read out the teams, um, read out the substitutions, read out like, oh, uh, there's a Ford Fiesta out in the car park, it needs to be, oh, you know what I mean? It was that. <laughs> they do the last game draw and stuff like you know. So, I just did it for, I did it for like maybe about eight, eight games or something. And then I just oh, like, right. I, I couldn't do it. I had to go to the. I mean, the thing is, you need to turn up, you know, a bit. <laughs> you know, at half past five, I'm supposed to be in the pub having a pint because you need a pint before you go and see Thistle, you know what I mean? There's, there's <laughs> to go with it, you know. But uh, no, I just chucked it and just went back because I had a season ticket anyway, so I still went, you know. But uh, yeah, that was it. Ground down, sir. No more. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, we'll go, we'll go back to drumming then because I think the drumming <laughs> part is more interesting than that ground I mean, announcer. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, stretch heads. Yes, I think that was in 1987, according to Wikipedia. Yeah, that's a yeah. Whole band. So, um, like from your first band, which stretch head is maybe how well, how many years or like how many bands before stretch head? Or was this your proper the first well, proper it, band that we were in? The first proper band, the first band that we we made records and we did like a demo proper demo. Yeah. We a guy for the finish side. We got a lot of help from um, Colin, if the Dog Faced Hermans, who was a band in Edinburgh at the time. They would like they'd help us out and put his gigs on and stuff, and we support them and stuff like that. 
And um, so we were just kind of like we guys just making a, 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 a riot of a noise, and we didn't really know what we we're doing. But I mean, that's what kind of made it. I mean, I don't know if, if you hear it, then you probably realise it sounds like we don't know what we're doing. But it did. It did sound different to a lot of things that were going on at the time, which is fine, you know. Um, but yeah, that was that was the first. That was the first record we ever did. Um, we were on the Shaman. We, we supported Stump in Edinburgh on the Friday night, and then I got a phone call the next day when I got home, yeah. and it was a, a guy that manages the Shaman, and he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. in Edinburgh, and I was like, we've just been to Edinburgh. And he was like, how do you want to come back? I was like, all right, okay. So I went and played, I was like, why the hell are we playing with the Shaman? Because they were starting to get quite dancey and ravey at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody hated it. You know, I mean, we had a great time, you know, because <laughs> we get like 50 quid in like 10 years. So we're like, oh, this is great, man. You know yeah. what I mean? But uh, but everybody hated it. Everybody, nobody, really? I don't think anybody applauded at all. They absolutely hated it. And they're all standing there with their glow sticks. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> we were just, like, vomiting all this horrible music and stuff them, can I? For 20 but minutes. He's a good. I mean, I like, he's a good. He's a good. That's the dream. And I love oh that. Right. Oh, right. 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 <laughs> but, but anyway, like, the guy phoned us up. We did the gig. Got our 50 quid and back up the road. He phoned me a couple of days later and says, right, um, I think we should do a record. Do you fancy doing a record? And I was like, ah, okay. Yeah, well, let's do an album. <laughs> and that was basically it. We did an album for them and a single. Um, yeah. Well, is that, is that mm? the EP called Brass our pish. No, Brass our pish was the uh, classic seven-inch single that we brought out man, in a brown paper bag. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to start actually listen to that, but it's not on YouTube, so I don't know how to sort like find <laughs> that one. <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> apparently that EP led to a sort of like a smash hits interview where Brass is. Not the Ross Brothers, but Craig, <laughs> but oh, Craig was... Logan, Craig Logan explaining to the Ross, uh, to the Ross Brothers, what Pish what meant. Pish means, uh, <laughs> was that the time that they said, um, they said, oh, we wish them well, but uh, there'll be plenty of process not going to buy their record. I was like, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> It was about 40 million brosets and there was only like a thousand copies, 250 copies of the single anyway, so they would have yeah. missed <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was funny. I forgot about that, actually. Yeah. But, but what does it mean anyway? It's like, pish. It's, a it's a Scottish word, isn't it? Oh, it's this like, means, um, well, let's put it this way, right? Pish, in this context, means rubbish. Oh, right. right. It means <laughs> things, but uh, it means rubbish. So bros are rubbish. So bros are pish. <laughs> I actually just made a badge. Well, I made a badge. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's a gross our pish. And um, we, when we supported Stump that night, uh, yeah. one of the guys for Stump thought it was a brilliant badge. And I was like, hey, man, you can have my badge. You know? And then, lo and behold, about two months later, we're like, uh, it was a little caught gross our pish. That would be funny. You know? <laughs> <laughs> gross our pish. <laughs> do you still have one? Do you still have one of those badges still? Well, I only made one badge. I only made one. one. I'll be in the bedroom. <laughs> but it's a from Stretchhead. Um, you you're in Dawson, which aye. I've got. Yeah, I've got to sort of like show this because this is like really good. Oh, I Dawson one that. Oh, the I one I'm yeah, <laughs> I got you and the others. Um, oh, Ali, aye. Ali, and um, Jer. Um, well, aye, sign, aye. last time I saw you. Um, so according, again, according to Wikipedia, um, it's oh no, this is like from um, Discogs actually. It's uh -huh. this Dawson were described as highly original punk band from Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Then the last time you played together as Dawson was in 1992, apparently. So, yeah, it was some of that. I think it was, I think I left, I think I left probably maybe that time and they did another album. Um, did they? Yeah, Tim on Island was the third album, wasn't it? Aye, it was I. But um, I wasn't on that one, but I, but I recorded it. So I was still, even though I left Dawson, I actually joined Dawson as a fan as well. Because I, when I heard Dawson, I was in the stretch yeah. at the time. And I met there in a record shop that I ended up working in a few months later. And he gave me a copy of the Dawson uh, cassette. And at that time, you know, you know when you're younger, you're a bit judgmental and all that, you know, because we saw... 
I saw uh, Dawson's name on a poster. I'm like, oh, Dawson, who would call Grant Dawson? You know what I mean? So we're having a about it, and then I met the guy from Dawson, and he gave me his tape, and I took it up the road, and I played it, and I was like, oh, my God, this is the best band I've ever heard. You know, because it was dead like Big Flame, and that is all I wanted, right? So basically, I, f- I was I went to see Dawson a couple of times. They were brilliant, really good. And uh, yeah, okay. the guys and just became pals with them. <clears> and I said there one day, I says, see if your drummer ever decides to leave or you throw him out or or you kill him or something like that, can I just, I'd, I'd be interested, you know what I mean? And he was like, oh, all right, I'll keep it in mind. And about a couple of months later, and he was like, this is the phone call. And I was like, right, cool, let's go. So I <laughs> and um, I joined him on the Tuesday, and our first gig was to Portland John Peel and Teenage Fan Club in Glasgow on the Friday, and then went on tour on the Saturday for a couple of weeks. And um, I, was oh. I, I was mental, I was a mad tour. I mean, every Dawson gig was pretty eventful. You know what I mean? Not, yeah. uh, not in an amazing way either, do you know what I mean? But uh, but certainly in a kind of uh, memorable way. <laughs> but but uh, how, not- easy it, how easy it is to sort of like learn the drum parts um, after, you know, like being from from stretch heads to sort of like Dawson? Oh, it, you're, such a, you're such a big fan of Dawson that you actually oh, well, I mean, know I, I, I know songs or... anyway. So I, I listen yeah. to them a lot, you know, and I'd probably like, I mean, I can think back, I probably like rehearsed them a wee bit as well. You know, just because when I when I was when I was learning how to play drums before the stretch heads, I'd, I'd be listening to Big Flame, and in my room, yeah. the noise coming out of my bedroom must have been unbelievable because I was listening to Big Flame really loud on the stereo and drumming a long way at the same time in a tiny bedroom in Erskine. You know, my mum and dad were brilliant; they didn't bother. They were like, "Oh well, just enjoy, him. just let him do his thing." You know, um, so that was really good. But uh, so I, I I probably did that with Dawson as well. You know, just so when the when when the chance arose. I was yeah. halfway there. I just had to kind of like, but it's different though, you know, when you're playing with people in the room, you know, it's, it's, you can play those songs like off the heart, but when you're playing with people in the room, you need to figure out the odds yeah. of wings and how you, because I'm still, even, even to this day, I'm still looking the chair for cues. Do you know what I mean? He's doing yeah. all the Hey guys, he's got it all up there, man. Do you know what I mean? So he's doing all he's, and then I'm kind of looking at him and he gives us wee nods and, you know, his eyebrows go up a wee bit. <laughs> I'm playing too fast, so I know that I need, I, I noticed that. From, I noticed that from that video that I took of you. So, like at Preston Pop, you were so like looking at chair. <laughs> I know. I mean, Ali's totally fine. Ali's like, I, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, right, chair. What did we do here again? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Um, I've noticed that all three of you are so like wearing two thirds shorts. <laughs> Right. And someone, and someone uh, on Facebook, um, his name is David Russell. He said that uh, Richie Dempsey is one of the nicest two-third shorts wearers he's ever met. No. <laughs> is that is that like um, a signature so like outfit for? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's, I think because like because uh, um. I, I'm, well, I used to be on the road a lot, but you know, pandemic and all that, you know, you don't get to tour much. But I used yeah. to wear shorts all the time because it's just easy to move around in, you know. Um, when you're kind of going from, you know, jumping up and doing the stage or going up and doing stairs at a theatre, you know, to check out the sound and stuff, you know, and it's just lighter, yeah. you know, it's a lot, a lot easier, than, you know, no breaking into a big sweat and stuff like that. And after a while, you kind of get used to, I mean, it's actually been quite a good Ned deterrent as well because, you know, you could Neds up here, like, you know, like you get chavs in England, you know. It's kind of like you know, like you know, not not nice people kind of thing. So when yeah. you're walking, you're walking about when it's snowing and you've got shorts on, they think it's near you. It's brilliant because they think you're absolutely mad. So <laughs> it kind of works. Dude, that would be great in the Philippines because in the Philippines we have a name for those kind of shorts. We call them so like puruntong puruntong shorts, but it's named Aye. it's named after um, a character. <clears throat> popularized by this so like we call him the king of comedy in the philippines dolphy who's like i'd say he's he's like the um frankie howard of of the film oh, yeah, yeah. yeah he is um yeah um so and again so like speaking of so like the front on shorts in the philippines i think that would be really good because in manila i don't you've been to the philippines you've told me before that, hey listen it's Shorts in the Philippines. Yeah. My life. Uh, they really did. We it was about thirty degrees outside. We went to this gig. We were doing a gig in the arena over there, right? 
and it was 30 degrees and we're just like oh man i cannot wait to get into that venue it'll be like air conditioned and everything we went to the venue right and the guy hadn't put the air conditioning on yet and it was about 35 degrees in there so when we actually putting everything together took about uh, at least about another hour and a half longer than it should have done because you had to really take your time you know and i was the only person wearing shorts <laughs> I don't know how you guys are doing this, man, but I'm dying here, you know. But I, <laughs> so, no <laughs> lifesaver. <laughs> so, um, so, what was your experience like in the Philippines? In the Philippines, it was. Yeah. Well, I did an OCT previously. Like when I was at school, we did a we did a um a, it was a competition, a regional competition, and apparently we won it. And it was all about the Philippines. So I remember drawing a jeepney. And it was, uh, I think I was called you a jeepney, yeah, yeah, and I put, uh, was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, we, we had that in part of the display, and um, the teachers came back and says, Yeah, we won, we were brilliant, but we never got any prize or anything like you know. I, I don't know if we did win, but anyway, it made us all feel good. So, anyway, when the chance came up to go to the Philippines, I was like, Right, brilliant, I can't wait. So, I went along there, and um, it was amazing, it was really good, it was uh, really hot. Uh, yeah, really. There was 18 of us went over there, right? 18 of us went over, like banding crew, and then all of a sudden there was like this big heavy guy just jumped into the front of the car and just to next to the driver and we drove off. I was like, "Who's this guy?" And they're like, "Oh, it's the security guard. We've got a bodyguard for the tour." I was like, <laughs> "Bodyguard for him?" I was like, "Of course." Because <laughs> the promoter says it's probably a good idea, so. Yeah. Uh, and then I kind of looked around, and it was about forty-five minutes to an hour to get to the hotel for the for the airport. I think, and I looked around. I kept seeing all these police motorbikes and stuff like that. There was one at the front, two at the side, and one at the back. And I was like, "We've got a police escort to this hotel." I think they picked up a van. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that that's that's the way it was. They made the hotel, and it was a big, beautiful hotel. Airport security yeah. in the hotel. <laughs> You know, everything was like quite kind of a bit, a bit edgy, you know what I mean? But it was like, yeah, people, yeah. you know, they were really, really nice and it was just lovely to be there, you know. And we got we got yeah. up in the run to, to leave. Yeah. I actually did get to see some jeepneys, which was nice. It was, that was my, my tourist attraction part. <laughs> oh, did you get on one of it? Did you get on I didn't get on one, no. But see, we, we didn't really get oh. to do anything. We went for a meal and then the next day we did the gig and then yeah. we went home. Back to the hotel and got up and we had to go like five in the morning. But I did notice that um, on the road to the to, to the to the airport, the um, there was like a big shopping area, and it was like maybe five in the morning or something like that. Five half past five, we got there, and it was like it was like anywhere else about three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, it was packed, absolutely. Packed. <laughs> it was like their body clocks must be mental, but uh, no, <laughs> like, really, 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 really good, like, really great experience being yeah. there. Really good. Glad to. It was well, definitely a tick in the market. Yeah, yeah it's, it's sort of like a 24 hour city because it's one thing that I've actually noticed when I moved to the UK, well, when I moved to Manchester, mm -hmm. um, especially in 1996 when shops close at five o'clock. Right. And it's like in the bars and the pubs close at 11. And I was like, in Manila, you can sort of like stay up until like six o'clock and start again. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's crazy that I mean, even when I moved to the south side of Glasgow, because I used to live in the West End for a while, and I moved to the south side, and there has a shop here called Old. It's not here anymore, but there's a cop shop called Old Days, which is like a twenty-four hour shop. That shop. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I was like, how does a twenty-four hour shop shop at half past five in the south side? You know. <laughs> But uh, well, not here anymore anyway. But I, I, that's quite. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, it's quite strange, you know, when you when you go to places like New York and all that as well, and you can just get you can get a drink at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, yeah, well, you know, do you have plans of going back to Manila? Manila or the Philippines? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to go back actually. I, like, yeah, yeah. I, I certainly do when, when 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 the weather's like this. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it was it was a lovely experience, you know what I mean? It was really good. Yeah, time. but it was a sort of like, I've got so like I've got so many things to ask you about your your um, bands. So I'm gonna sort of like see, um, David Russell also said that you're the most talented Jags fan he's ever met, aside from John <laughs> Brandy. Now this this is again it's so new to me because Jags when I looked it up. On um on Google, it actually gave me so like 
Jacksonville Jaguars. And I was sort of like thinking, mm-hmm. it can't it can't be right. I mean, why why is he a fan of Jacksonville Jaguars? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so, so I've, changed, I've changed my sort of like search for Jags fan Glasgow. Right. Yeah, it actually, yeah. <laughs> it gave me the right one, which is like Partick. Partick Thistle. Aye. Part, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's um, my team. Aye. Yeah. So I finally got the right one for it, and then John that's Lambie. I also googled him as well, and uh, I found out he's the manager. Well, he was the manager, but sadly he died a couple of years ago. Um, he was, he was, he was like a, a, a brilliant guy, totally amazing. Yeah. I only ever met him once in a pub in Cowden Beath. Um, yeah. You know, that, that was that was a weird day. But um, but I I loved John Lambie. He was, he was a great great guy, really really a legend at, at Party Thistle. You know, um, but I I actually went to his funeral. It was funeral funerals are. They're weird experiences, right? But this one was an absolute belter. <laughs> it, was, it was really, it was amazing in every way. It was, I mean, it was really sad and, and it was so, so funny and so sad at the yeah. same time. Do you know what I mean? Because it was. But it's a celebration. It's a celebration of one's life, isn't it? So you've got to sort of like see it as not just as a sad event. But it's also remembering how brilliant one person is. Well, yeah, I mean that, that's basically what it was. It was like it was yeah. a celebration of his life, and it was basically yeah. like because um, the church, the, the chapel, or the church, it was like maybe about four or five hundred people in it, and it was maybe about like one hundred and fifty or two hundred and fifty people outside. The we were supporters, so I didn't feel that I had any divine right to go in there. You know what I mean? But I stood outside yeah. at the, the PA. You know what I mean? So you could hear it, and the guy that was actually conducting the whole thing was like. We're going to have a celebration of his life. There's going to be songs. There's going to be clips of uh, uh, audio clips from like the TV program that was on about him in the BBC a few years ago, you know, and, and yeah. various stories from ex players and stuff like that. And it was brilliant, you know. What I mean, it was really good. Everybody came out. It was very entertaining. Do you know what I mean? And it was, yeah, it was, okay, like, okay. it wasn't like a regular funeral. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't. It was a really, for me, it was a bit of a star-studded event because it was full of party ex party Thistle players. Do you know what I mean? But there was yeah. a, it was it was sad at the start, but but you know there was people just rolling about laughing because it was because he was crazy. Do you know what I mean? He was a real good real good guy, you know. But I, well, was, that uh, Partick uh, Thistle, I remember when I saw that on them. When I was sort of like um, researching it, I realised now that I remember that name from this. From this, I don't know if you can see it, but it's oh, a I, this uh, thing. It's oh, a record because yeah, um, there's an insert in it that says um, "Drums Richie" and appears courtesy of this sort of like part of this or city center branch branch. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's where oh. I remember it from. It's like, oh my god, yeah, I've, I've seen that name before. So because I'm not really a big football fan, I don't know many. Uh, well, a lot of people would say that about me because Patrick was very really different to football, you know. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I know, I, I, I was see around about that time. I was absolutely obsessed with Thistle. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was ridiculous. You know, I would, I would maybe drive down to London and do a gig overnight. You know, on on the Friday, and then I drive back up so I could go to the Thistle game the next day. I mean, I don't uh-huh. know. I used to go <laughs> horrible, horrible paces for that. You know what I mean? It was terrible. Yeah. I do apologise to all of them right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was—it was pretty. It was, I was quite obsessed with that. Do you know what I mean? But um, yeah, but you a wee bit, a wee bit. <laughs> and that's what's up up in the door. Oh, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, let's talk about Lugworm. Um, Hi, that band. Uh, it says it was formed as a duo in 1992. So it's mm-hmm. you and another person who formed uh, mm-hmm. Lugworm. It, it, here is another story of me filling in for the guy that couldn't make it type thing. So I turned out to be that guy for a while. So I basically, uh, Lugworm is Depp from Monorail. You've been in Monorail, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Monorail, yeah, yeah. So it's him and Graham that used to be in Ganger. And he's currently in a band called The Gymnastic Band, who I think you should check out. They're really good. Anyway, me, me and Graham, whose nickname is Jas. We were at school together and, and we shared a flat together years and years later and stuff like that. So we're still good pals. But he they, they just give us a, it was another one of those like we need to do this record and um our drummers no our drummer anymore. 
uh, so can you do it? And I was like, I'll just jump in. Aye, it's fine. So I think I did a rehearsal with him and we went in and recorded yeah. it. And uh, I think it's just two tracks on that, isn't it? I think we did three tracks. Yeah, and there's um, one that's in the Guided Missile compilation and the two tracks are on that EP. Rococo Negro. <laughs> Negro, is that right? Aye. Yeah, yeah. So, so like... It's actually where Monorail is where I found this record actually, and right. I oh, didn't know. About, yeah, I found it in there, and I didn't know about Lugworm, but because I saw Biss in mm -hmm. Manchester like a few years ago, right, and I right. Thought, oh, this is really good. And then I saw the insert and saw your name there, and um, I found this on the day that I actually went to see you doing a sound check at the Glad Cafe. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I thought, oh my god, that is so good. <laughs> but yeah. um, so after that, after Lugworm, you had mm -hmm. another. You were in another band called Fen, and, um, <clears throat> and you released an album called Spanish mm -hmm. in 1993. So you never really stopped working as a drummer. You were so like doing all this from. Well, from yeah. Well, I, well I, I, I just kept doing stuff. You know what I mean? Because I was. I, I mean, I just like I like playing. Do you know what I mean? And I think Fen was quite a kind of. Uh, I, I I love being in Fen. It was great. It was really good. It was. I mean, because we were really into Swerve Driver, and we were just kind of like, right, let's be the Scottish Swerve Driver. You know what I mean? It was kind of like that. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I was really like, right, Graham, Graham Bonner was drumming um, from like the first Swerve Driver yeah. album. It's just like I did. This band are brilliant. You know what I mean? So yeah. so I was great. I, I quite influenced by Swerve Driver at the time. Um, very actually, but um, I found was great. But but found was the moment when I woke up because I, I must have been in maybe early twenties or something like that. And I woke up one day and I was just like, I mean, we went down to London and uh, we played a gig with oh, I can't remember who it was. It was it was, it was at the Bull and Gate in Kentish Town, and there was a four band bill, and we were the last band on, and the other three bands were industrial. Metal band, not a metal, what? but industrial bands like I think it was Leech Women or something. Like that. It was one of the other bands, or something like that, right? So they went yeah. on, and, and then we went on, and like basically, even our record label decided to leave halfway through the gig. You know what I mean? And it was, <laughs> I know, you know. Well, I actually listened to that album on YouTube because I did, and I, I, I was all like thinking, my God, you really drum so fast. It was ah. really, really fast. Oh, <laughs> <really>? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I think when I could back up the road after that gig, I just woke up one day and I was like, nah, I'm going to chuck this man. I'm not going to do it anymore. You know what I mean? Just going to get rid of the drum kit. I'm not going to be a rock star. You know, because I obviously want to be a rock star of sorts. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, but it, I can't woke up and it's just like, it's not going to happen. I'll just do something else. And then I met somebody... Um, uh, and they, they were like, oh, I heard you were selling your drum kit. And I was like, I'm not doing it anymore. And they're like, no, 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 you don't do that. I was like, all right. <laughs> so how long did Fen last? Um, last? Uh, probably about four, five years, maybe. Five years, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. There were a few kind of like personnel changes and stuff like that, you know. Um, but it was, yeah, it was good. It was good. I mean, it was that... It was that kind of thing where we're all pals, you know, and like all the bands I've been in, they've been like, yeah. they've all been pals. Do you know what I mean? I've never really, I don't think I've really joined a band as in like, right, I'm, I'm the drummer and you're the band and, and I'll have try and be pals with you type thing, you know what I mean? It's just like we're all, we've all been pals and it's made loads of sense and it's been therefore fun, you know? Um, so a fan was you know, nothing different to that. We were just, you know, just a bunch of mates just, you know, mm -hmm. playing songs that we thought were pretty good. Yeah, but you still lasted. You still lasted <laughs> five years though, which is really good. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was pretty good, pretty sporadic. You know, I mean, we just kind of like we just rehearsed and we had to rehearse, but you yeah, know I mean? yeah. We didn't, we didn't go in like every week and all that, you know, because we we're just kind of like, well, life got in the way. Do you know what I mean? Like one of the guys had uh, got married and had a kid and stuff like that, then moved to Perth, and um, you know, so right. it was, like, we, we, you know, and then after a while, you, you kind of realise like. This is this isn't going to pay my rent, you know what I mean. So I need to go and get a job, and I got a job cleaning. You know what I mean. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's um another band that um I can't find any information on <laughs> on Google. PH Family. Right, PH Family. That takes us a perfect segue, actually. Right, so when I decided that I wasn't going to play drums anymore, right. 
I we we played a gig. One of the last one of the last fan gigs we did was in the thirteenth note in Glasgow Street, and PH family were playing as well. So I phoned the pub that I was working in. Right, I think that's right. I was basically working somewhere else. And I phoned. I I was working doing. Uh, sorry, I'm pointing there. I didn't know. But um, <laughs> I, I was working doing this kind of management company that, that me and my pal John set up, and um, I phoned the pub to speak to somebody, and somebody found out that I was on the phone, and it turns out it was one of the guys that did the door, right? And who this is all very convoluted, but he was in PH family, right? So so he 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 he's like, oh yeah, go, we've just chucked our drummer out the band. Uh, do you want to join? And I was like, nah, not really. And he was like, ah, you should. I was like, all right. You know, and then so I went I went to see them and they were just dead big guys, you know what I mean? And they're like, all right, but we're going to rehearse in Clyde Bank next week, you coming? I was like, All right, okay. I just I felt a wee bit scared, you know what I mean? So I was like, I better I better move through the you know what I mean, or they'll kill me. <laughs> I went in and um, and uh, we just played and I kinda started destructuring the songs a little bit, kinda thing, because they kinda went on a wee bit, you know. And we were like, let's try this, let's try that. And uh, that was brilliant, that was really good. And one of one of my best pals, I got one of my best pals out here, a guy called uh, Alex Grant, who him and I uh, and Fraser for the band PH Family, when we all broke up, we started the Salvo together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Alex has moved to Australia a few years ago. He's he works for like um, Midnight Oil and stuff like that. He's a production manager, like you know, John Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he's he's doing great over there, you know. So I so basically me and Alex got and did well. We hung about together and we went to see bands all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, it was, that, that was a brilliant thing because it was really good to get a pal like that. Do you know what I mean? Because we were, we had a really good connection, really into heavy metal and all that, and just go and see Helmet all the time, and you know, just loads and loads of music collective gigs and stuff like that. And yeah, all okay. the time it was brilliant. Good laugh, you know. Well, what's the connection between PH Family and Idlewild? Because I remember the name Idlewild from um, they played at Shine On Festival in 2019, but. Sadly, I didn't go and see them. I don't know why, why I didn't. Well, I was doing that either. <laughs> I was maybe somebody else that night. I met up with them. With, with, <laughs> I think I was with, with Kareem Polwart, actually. And well, you yeah, Shine On? Huh? Yeah. Did you go Shine On in 2019? No, I didn't go. No, no, I had to get somebody, somebody filled in for me because I was I was with somebody else that night. Um, doing oh, right, yeah, so yeah. I, went down to, I went down to meet them in Bristol. And we were, I think we were heading to Manchester or something after, after. Yeah, yeah. But um, I so I never saw them, but the connection with Peach Family, connection with Peach Family and Idlewild is, uh, well, there's a couple. One of them was Idlewild's first ever headline tour. Was we, Peach Family, supported them on tour because we were all kind of pals as well, you know, because the guy that was managing us was kind of like helping out Idlewild and they started up. Uh, so basically that happened. So we did the tour together. And then um, Alan Stewart joined Idlewild, and then it brought us on to the connection of oh no, and then Alex from PH Family became the, the bass player, became Idlewild's bass tech. So he became their bass tech, and then and then Alan Stewart from Alan Stewart, a guy that we have and had the salvo, um, yeah. the salvo. He ended up joining Idlewild, and then I ended up joining Idlewild as a sound guy and now tour manager. So the connections are there, you know. Oh. I mean, it's <laughs> wow, well, they're all sort of like one big family then. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. It's, it's good that way, you know. It's good that way. everybody's cool that way. <laughs> well, okay. Well, you you were talking about the salvo. So before we actually talk about your current sort of like band, some shapes, we're mm. gonna um, talk about it because I've got loads of questions for you about um, the salvo. <laughs> Okay. Um, and I was so like saying to you before we get uh, we came on live that I listened to um, this album's album. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> and this was like at five o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and, and I had the full volume on. It was so like I went on YouTube and looked for this album, and the first sort of, like song that I saw there, it's like. It's a seven minute long. It's like part one and part two. So oh, I just saw, like, yeah, so I just put it on. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh my God. It was actually, I got scared, I got scared because it's like five o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, this you know, 
thing going on. Yeah, so yeah. I said, like, where's the volume? So I can just so like turn it down. Dude. I don't want the neighbors so like waking up. Yeah, no, I know. So, <laughs> how many hours have you been evicted yet? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's it's uh, the album's called Mood Poisoner. Mood Poisoner. Like right. Mood Poisoner. Yeah. Um. So uh, according to Wikipedia. Uh, it was formed in 1998, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a metalcore band and described as one of Scotland's most prominent sociopathic. <laughs> I can't even sound like most one of Scotland's most prominent sociopathic hardcore acts. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> That's from Wikipedia, and then another thing <laughs> is. <clears throat> And again, I mean, this again, this is from Wikipedia. Um, right. The Salvo developed a confrontational and sexually aggressive <laughs> reputation. Sexually uh, aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> became, <laughs> became infamous <laughs> for arousing live performance. Aye. I was like, wow. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it, was, it was good. Time, yeah. yeah, so, um, what. <laughs> Why do you think Wikipedia would say something like that? I mean, I don't know. I've got, um, before I ask you a question, can you just tell us more about this album first? <laughs> first of all? This album, I mean, I mean, I have to be honest, I think this album was the best band I've ever been in. You know what I mean? I, I, they, were, they were brilliant. You know, it was, it was really, really good. Really good fun. Um, really a total workout for me, you know, as I'm, as I'm getting older, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, and just basically kind of like I think personally we, we, we kind of wrote we kind of wrote things that we couldn't play and learned how to play them a bit do you know what I mean well I, I certainly couldn't play them then I had to learn them you know what I mean but but yeah. it was like it was that kind of thing where we kind of challenged each other a wee bit more do you know and I think also Alex the guy I was telling you about is, is a very um, quite responsible for that you know what I mean and, and I mean that in a good way because it's dead easy to just get complacent and become you know, generic metal bands or, or, or whatever, you know. But we wanted to be a bit, a bit more than that. Because we were listening to, like, things like, you know, Dylan's Escape Plan, Converge, Helmet, uh, you know, just things like that, you know. Yeah. You know, just really, just quite heavy things, you know. Yeah. So so we just kind of wrote as much as we could. And it actually helped, because, like, we'd, been, when it, we'd go in and rehearse a bunch of stuff, and then we'd record it just on a CD or something like that. And then me, Alan, and... Uh, Alex would be out in, out in America with Idlewild for like seven or eight weeks. So we'd just sit in the back lounge of the bus and just kind of like talk through things and try and dissect things and try and build a song yeah. around parts that we've got. So basically when we came back, you know, uh, we'd, we'd maybe have something relatively new to play, you know. It was always like we'd, people for the band, for the Idlewild band, would, would come in at the back lounge and the theatre would be sitting there and then they're like, all right, Better not get in there, dissolve or verbally rehearsing kind of thing, you know. It's like, I beat it. You said the wings or whatever, you know what I mean? But, but uh, no, we would, just, we would just do that. And, you know, um, just music came through that, you know. Just but what, was it, what was it like? So, like, live, I mean, what's the audience reaction like? Because I'm sort of like, actually, I find this really fascinating that. You know, uh, especially when it's a sexually aggressive reputation. I mean, what what does that mean? It was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't get to see it. Hidden with symbols and that, you know. So, well, well, we've got this singer Phil, right? Who's like, I love that guy so much, man. He's like one of my best pals ever. You know, he's just a brilliant guy, um, and uh, we're still dead good pals. We've fallen out twice, and all the time we've known each other. And it's over bands because me and Phil used to be in the stretch head together and we were yeah, in the yeah. And you know, we fell out and they knew why we fell out, but we just didn't even talk about it. But we don't we don't worry about that anymore, you know. But um, Phil's very uh he's, he's he's right in your face, do you know what I mean? He's he's but he's the nicest guy, do you know what I mean? But he's he kinda dresses up as like a butcher's apron and a pig's nose and sometimes he'd have a bandage on his head like a mummy, do you know? And then it was like and that would be it, you know. So and then he yeah. spent a lot of kinda of like, you know, Sort of pumping monitors and you know being in the crowd. And just I mean it was it was brilliant. I mean you kind of look up sometimes. I mean a lot of yeah. times I was concentrating and just like you know watching our two guys and making sure we were all kind of locked in. So it was like a three piece band with this insanity guy 
just running all over the place, going mental. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and if, a lot of people find it very intimidating, but a lot of people find it really, really exciting. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. it was really exciting. It was, it was different. I mean, it was different, but it was like there's been millions of bands like that. Do you know what I mean? But um, but I think probably at that time in Glasgow, there, there, there really wasn't that much. You know, there's a lot of metal bands, and they're really, really, really brilliant. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I know it was. It was just. It was a really. I, I mean, I didn't see it as like a big shock thing, you know, because I mean, it was, normally, you know, it, was, it was fine. It was just like, it's just like just plain, pretty heavy music. Probably. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not new. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was, I was really good fun. Really, really good fun. I, you know. Well, now here are the questions from Ian Stewart. Ian, um, oh, good guy. He, he's, yeah, just, Ian. he's a brilliant drummer. He's a really good guy. Ian Stewart's a drummer. Ah, he plays with uh, Red Magnetic. Well, I've got to sort of like message him then. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so here are the questions from him. Because mm -hmm. um, he wants to know everything about the recording of um, Mood Poisoner. Mm -hmm. So he said, um, uh, which apparently, well, this again, from according to Wikipedia, that it's been disowned and deleted so that you can't find any copies of it anymore is that what it means or i'm pretty sure uh, rock action have got a lot of copies sure have, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in their office up right now but yeah i mean it's there's, 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 i don't know how many press, press up, maybe like a thousand or something like that you know right okay, it was so... out and it was like thrown out there and it was just like right buy it you know it's like no <laughs> no <laughs> right. that's not the label talk because they were great you know Oh, well, Ian Stewart wanted to know um, the drum tracking. How long did it take to do all those songs? Yeah, um, and was everything first take? He also asked. Uh, I'll uh, some of them were first take. Some of them were first take. Um, most of it, pretty much, I think, but took about from from setting the kit up and getting everything sounding right and playing. Probably took about a day and a half to get all the drums done. Um, yeah, because right, okay. yeah, usually, I mean, there's a, it's, there's, oh, I don't know, man, it's just like, there's a few happy accidents in there. Do you know what I mean? Like, usually I'll just have this thing where I've got in my head that I'll do three takes of a song. If I get it first time, that's it, it's done, right? But if I'm not sure about it, I'll do it second time or I'll do it a third time. And if I can't get it done the third time, Scrap it and go back to it later on. Do you know? Um, that's about. I think that's as far as I can remember. I, not, not some of them are done first take. I can't tell you which ones they were, but um, uh, I but a day and a half for for the for the whole lot for, for for the drums anyway. You know. Well, his next question is: How hard did you hit the drums? <laughs> quite, <laughs> how quite hard did you? <laughs> quite, quite hard. Hard. Hard enough. To know better, you know, <laughs> if I had them lighter, I probably wouldn't have been out of breath as much, you know. What I mean, because I'm not as fit as I used to be, you know. But uh, hard, hard enough, hard enough to hard make enough. And <laughs> how many sticks or symbols broken? None, <laughs> one stick, one stick. Um, didn't break any symbols, didn't break any symbols. <laughs> and he also wanted to know the influences for the drum parts as well. The influence for the drum parts, man. All oh, right, right. Well, uh, John Stania from Helmet, massive influence on that kind of music that I was playing at the time. So, Helmet, big time. I mean, yeah, uh, John Stania, I guess. And there's also like, um, you know, it's a Dylan's Escape Plan. Basically, the bands that I mentioned earlier on as well, and maybe the drum sound was maybe kind of. Probably inspired by, um, let's say, by maybe Jane Doe, uh, Converge album, you know. Right. So I mean, it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like I was like kind of snapshot of what we were really into. Not saying that we were trying to be those bands, you know what I mean, but just like taking inspirations, you know what I mean. And uh, you know, we never stole any ideas off them at all. <laughs> well, they, these are also like new to me because I think, well, you've actually saw like opened my ears to a different genre of music because yes basically i'm so like <laughs> 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 totally brilliant <laughs> 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 
because <laughs> I'm really just more into so like what we call in the Philippines new wave right. um, and um like I was telling you before that um uh Ian Donaldson of H2O mm -hmm. That is kind of music, like a new wave music. That's what's really so like big in the Philippines, and that's what yeah. we were listening to when I was uh, when I was a kid. And again, I mean, the reason why I'm so like why to talk about Ian Donaldson is I believe you're like neighbors with Ian Donaldson. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes you know. <laughs> I don't know the guy. I don't know the guy. I've seen him because I remember like uh, when H2O were out in sort of eighty. Oh, what was that? Eighty. Four, something like that, maybe. Like when I dream of sleep in Hollywood Dream and all that came out, that was the early 80s, right? Um, and seeing him in town and all that, I was like, oh, I was like, I and stuff like that. And then it was a wee while ago, um, I was at the train station, uh, getting, getting into town, and he was standing there, and I was like, no way, that's the guy for H2O. And it was quite, like, I wasn't like a big fan of the band and all that, you know, but it was that kind of thing where it takes you back to like, God, he was. He was big news in Glasgow a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> I, he lives, I think he lives upstairs with my pal, a guy I know, uh, my mate Carlos. He used to play with a band called Sin Dogs, who'd like Sal Clemenson for the Alex Harvey band in the minute, you know. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I think he's living the same close, you know, but uh, he's only two minutes from the corner. Right? <laughs> well, the Monday, you know? <laughs> well, the last time I saw you, because I, the, the reason why I couldn't stay... Um, to see your band, uh, see some shapes, um, is because I went to see Ian Donaldson at the Admiral in Glasgow that time. So uh, that, but wait, he was so was kind. Busy, was, that, was that quite a busy gig? Because I'd imagine it probably would have been. It was so, at the Admiral, yeah. It was, yeah. And because um, it was really kind of you when, when, when you said that you're playing at the Glad Cafe and I told you that I've already got plans, but I'll be in Glasgow, but not that yeah. but it's not like see Ian Donson. And then you invite me to go and see your sound check. I thought, oh, that's really, really good. Oh, yeah. that's good. Well, that's <laughs> like, so for me, it's like seeing two bands in one, you know, in one year. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, the good thing is you got to see the Glad Cafe as well. So, I mean, that's a brilliant place, you know. You yeah, need, yeah. Come up to, I mean, just, well, at the moment, there's no gigs. Because there's no gigs anywhere in Scotland, but um, when it starts up again, it's, a, it's an amazing place to go. Eh? The lovely, yeah. lovely yeah. venue, you know, food is brilliant in there. The pizzas are amazing, but um, the, the good, good booze and all that as well. And the people, yeah. people are brilliant. So, so you should definitely, definitely uh, look at what's happening up there as well if you get a chance to come back. Well, um, I know that you're also a sound engineer, but were you sort of like? What about doing sound engineer for Ian Donaldson? Because especially when he goes back to the, when he goes to the Philippines, hopefully he will do it. Oh, that'd be great! Yeah. That would be great, wouldn't it? I'd imagine, yeah, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, going back to the salvo, um, Colin and Arthur ask, um, when are the salvo coming back for a gig? <laughs> That's why he, he, he's obviously a fan of the salvo, but. I am not 100% confident that's going to happen, I'm afraid to say. But we, we started, uh, me, Alan and Phil, uh, were in pre-pandemic. I actually blame, it's our fault with this pandemic, because we start, we, everyone was fine until David Bowie died, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, so basically we, um, we went and rehearsed and we basically went in to see if we could still play, play you know, and then we could, so it was good. Um, but we just really haven't got it together. I don't, I'm not 100 percent confident it's going to happen with the salvo. Although I do think we will do something else, which I think is going to be even more brutal. So I think that you never know. You know, I mean, never say never. I'd love to come back. <laughs> yeah, never say never. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're planning on it anyway. Do you know, I mean, we had a meeting uh, after a few rehearsals around about yeah. February 2020. Um, we're talking about maybe doing a gig, you know, starting up maybe June, July of that year, but obviously, you know, you know what happened. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> basically, kind of like, we're all being safe, not going to rehearse and stuff like that as well because of this pandemic and nobody knew what was going on. So just like, you know, let's not do anything just now and see what happens. But but also, like, Alan works for like, Primal Scream. And he works for uh, Franz Ferdinand, and he works for the Jesus and Mary chain. So he's going to be away tour next year, you know, and I'll be away yeah. with Arabs and stuff like that as well. So, yeah. you know, yeah. so it's, when we're trying to find time to kind of lock in, you know, maybe 
maybe a bit typical, but if it, if it happens, I mean, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to do it again. I really would. I'd love to yeah, get it. But you're now in some shapes, mm -hmm. and some shapes are, um, are you, do you have like gigs planned for this year or? Well, we were talking the other night, we were just kind of messaging each other because I, I kind of realised that I hadn't played drums for absolutely ages, you know, and I was like, I better, better kind of do something. But, um, so, I uh, messaged them anyway, and I think what we're going to try and do is get together sometime in February and just, like, maybe try and get this, because we've been talking about getting this new album together for, like, ages, you know, I mean, yeah. ages, you know what I mean, but we've just, it's another thing that life's got in the way, like, Jer's really busy, with his work, he's doing loads and loads of music projects, and Ali's doing loads and loads of stuff as well, and I'm doing yeah. allegedly loads of stuff. I don't know, um, but uh, I, I think February we're going to try and maybe get something together, like try trying to block a time that we can actually maybe make, make, make the record, and uh, you know we'll do some some gigs. I mean, no, nobody any extent. We're not really a, a extensive touring kind of band that you may have noticed, you know. But yeah. we'll maybe just do maybe like a bunch of gigs in Scotland and. Go back to Preston and maybe do something in London or something. Maybe that'll be that'll be yeah. that, you know. Well, some shapes are actually Dawson, so like back together again, but with a different Aye. name. So that's a Aye. some shapes album there. Um, David Chambers said that <clears throat> he was just listening to it and it's a cracking album, according to him. Oh, yeah, I actually you. got it. Yeah, I actually got it on when I woke up this morning as well. Like, I uh -huh. do agree. I do agree with David. It's a cracking, yes. cracking album. So, <laughs> yeah. So, and also, thank you. So, again, it's nicely signed by all three of you. Which yeah, that, that was a nice picture. So, who, who took that picture? Uh, what well, I was thinking, my wife would take it. <laughs> I had a new one came with the, the sound check as well. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And the daughter was there. So. Aye, well, we can't get a babysitter. It's really hard to get a babysitter these days. I think we've got, got things sorted now, but but uh, Sarah's not been at a gig. I can't even remember the last time she was at a gig or something. Maybe like oh, a year ago or something, you know? So the nearest yeah. you guys can get to the gig is come to see me. Bar hell out of drum kit for twenty minutes at a sound check. So much fun. <laughs> yeah, I really love that photo of um, me and you or all of us in uh, some shapes. That was yeah, really it was cool. a good one. Yeah. yeah. So um, apart from drumming, um, we mentioned earlier that you're also doing um, like sound engineering work, mm -hmm. and and um, I found out that you're like a, an Audix sound engineer. For uh, a band called Of Monsters and Then. Well, I used and, to be. Not anymore. Um, oh, not anymore, yeah. I, I used to be hanging so go into it. Um, I worked with Monsters and Men for about two, three years, maybe. And um, we, we got like this, some kind of deal with Audix to supply yeah. and stuff like that for the vocals. Because, I mean, they've got like seven singers. It was like, was it nine? No, oh, no. Nine vocals. The last time I checked. Nine. Yeah, nine. But nine they're vocals. like. Uh, they're an Icelandic band. Aye, uh, aye. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. They were really good. And we did loads and loads of loads of touring together. It was great. Um, so, but you know, things change. You know, priorities change, and you know, they got a new production manager, I think, and he brought his guys in and stuff like that. So it's fine. You know, I'm sort of yeah, nice. yeah. And no, that's really when, you're, when you're a touring engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, what um, how you got to Manila is being the ah, sound engineer ah, of Monsters and Men. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm, I didn't even know that they played in Manila of Monsters and Men. I've got to sort of, like, check them out, because I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I've not heard of these bands. So. <laughs> well, they, were, they were a brilliant band. They were really, really, really great great to work with. Really, really nice people. You know, I mean, they couldn't have been any nicer, you know, and it was like, and that's the thing, you know, if you've, I've worked with a few bands that have been not so nice, and the tours have been pretty horrible. Um, yeah. But more often than not, if the band are nice, it's going to be fine. Do you know what I mean? It's just all been, been pretty cool. Do you know what I mean? So, I yeah. mean, everybody's got to live with each other for a period of time, you know. And yeah. you know, but, but with those guys, there was no problems at all. They were they were totally cool. You know, and nobody yeah. really you could you could read them pretty well because it was just yeah. well, everybody could read each other pretty well. Do you know what I mean? If everybody needed a bit of time, just let them have their time. You know, and it's see them more. Well, being a sound engineer, um, now that I'm going to sort of like lots and lots of gigs, I mean, sound engineers actually make 
the band um, better sound, you know, sounding better. I mean, they're band good enough as themselves, but the sound engineer mm -hmm. sort of like make them sound even better. Well, sometimes. I think it's like when you know when you go to a, when you go and see a band and. Uh, at the end, they always sort of like thank the sound engineers who sort of like. And, yeah, that, I mean that's that's know? nice. You know, I mean I think like, um, I mean it's it's kind of weird like when you're working on the road with a band and you're touring with them, being the sound guy, you've got to be. Well, you don't have to be, but personally, what I do is I kind of put myself in the position where I actually am, like. The other member of the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, so I mean, I've got to be just as good as them. Do you know what I mean? Uh, because they could be playing the best gig of their life up there, and if it sounds like it's underwater, then it's a waste of time. Do you know what I mean? So I've got to be, I've got to be as good as them, and it doesn't happen all the time. Do you know what I mean? It's just like any sound engineer that says, "Oh, I'm brilliant and I'm the best," and every gig I do sounds brilliant. It's just fucking rubbish. You know what I mean? Because there's, there's yeah. many, many factors. We all have bad days, you know. Um, but if you got a good band that sounds really good at source then half the work's done, you know, and then that's up to you to do either creative mixing or, uh, which is loads of fun, um, or uh, you're basically dealing with a PA and a room, uh, an empty room, mm -hmm. and then a full room, like two or, two or three hours later, and they sound completely different. And you got to kind of, you know, make changes or just kind of like, you know, sort of make educated guessing as well, like how it's going to sound when there's 5,000 people. Like Brixton Academy, Brixton Academy empty, it's terrifying, right? It's horrible. The bass drum's like, Pfft. it just doesn't stop, you know? But then you put 5,000 people in there and it's like, Doof. you know? So it's, it's but things like that, do you know what I mean? It's just like, you don't want to take too much of the PA because you're going to have to put it back in again. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, I don't know, it's just like experience kind of helps with that. Yeah, know? yeah. And, and a good band and good, and good stage techs that know exactly what, they, what, they're, what they're doing, you know? So it's well, not just, it's just like the band, and the, the monitor engineer and and the, the guitar techs and the drum techs and stuff. It's I, I see it as a collective effort. You know what I mean. So we're all we're all holding the trophy at the end of the night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, being being a sound engineer and being a drummer, um, mm. do you sometimes want to sort of like say that oh you're not doing the right thing? You know, you've got so. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> or do you just let do you just no, let the no. sound engineer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's totally up to that. I'll, I'll never tell a drummer how to play. Do you know what I mean? I'll never do that. It's just like I think that's up to the way they they, they do their thing. Do you know what I mean? What um, about the other way around? Will you tell the sound engineer to sort of like say, "No, you've got to." Oh wait, well, I, I mean the thing is, <laughs> when I was younger, right before before I was a sound engineer, right, I would go to gigs and I would just like go and get steaming and have a brilliant time and enjoy the band and not think too much about it. But see, when you become a sound engineer, you go to, you go to see gigs. And you, it's really, I mean, I, I have, I, that's the thing I hate about it, right? I only go and see gigs that I really, really need to go to, right? Right? I you really need it. to go to them, right? Um, and if, because, because they're the gigs that you know are probably going to sound good, right? Because, you, I don't know, it's just like, because I go and see, because I like Genesis and I like Steely Dan and I like, <laughs> and I like blah, 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 blah. You know, there's probably a pretty good chance that the engineer's going to be on the ball the band can play really well, do you know what I mean? So you kind of like, if I go to a wee gig, I'm, sometimes I'm like, I can't do this, you know what I mean? You know, it's, it's, got, it's, it's a stupid thing, but I know loads, people don't mention it, but I know loads of sound engineers are the same. When you walk, when you see a sound engineer walking into the venue, you start to get a bit nervous going like, oh, he's got, a, he's got an opinion on this right away. So that kind of thing, you know, I mean, I went, it was about three years ago, Maybe three or four years ago, I went to see. I flew over from Australia. I was in Australia with my wife because uh, we're at we're at a wedding, and I flew over early because I had to go and. Well, I, I actually, this is true. I had to go and see, see Steely Dan because I've never seen them before. So me, I've got, got tickets. Me and my mate get tickets. So I met him in London. Yeah. We went to see Steely Dan, and I was <laughs> really looking forward to it. And then I got really nervous because it was in the O2, um, the O2 uh, Arena in, in London, and it was like yeah, yeah. Capacity, and I was like. What if it sounds rubbish? What if this is going to sound terrible? This is going to blow. This is going to blow me out of the water here, you know. 
And they came, they came on and just happened on stage and it sounded absolutely perfect to the word go. And I was like, Aww. that's fine. <laughs> 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 I used to steal it, Danny, um, to ring out a PA, you know, to, to sound check the room, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's like, and, and they are kind of like the, 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 the band that like loads and loads of kind of the cliched sound engineers <clears throat> tool is using Steely Dan for a lot of us, you know. <laughs> um, I was a bit nervous that they were going to sound rubbish, but every single gig I've been to that I wasn't doing sound at over the past few years has sounded great. <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> Well, apart from being a sound engineer, you're also a tour manager? Aye. That yes. That's fun. No. What? <laughs> <laughs> So what what does a tour manager do? <laughs> it's all like um, which bands are you to manage? Uh, Arab Strap. I do I do Arab Strap. Uh, been doing Idlewild for a few years. I've done I've, I think maybe for the past maybe five or six years. Yeah. Even that, I've been doing Idlewild. Um, done other bands uh, the past few years, but I mean the, the current bands I do are like uh, Arab Strap and Idlewild anyway. You know, yeah. and to be honest with you, those guys are absolutely no bother. You know, I mean, they're, they're, we're all about the same age, although I'm older, but I mean, they're just all younger than me. But you know, there's there's no kids. You know what I mean? But we're all we've all got kids. Do you know what I mean? So we're all kind of like doing short tours when we get a chance, and everybody's very adult about it. And you know, there's no, yeah. you know, there's there's no kind of like, oh, can you get me drugs in the middle of the night type guys? You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> you know, it's actually pretty easy. It's just all about the dancing. You know? Fancy things like you know weeks and weeks to go, and then it all comes together, and, and then it's just you know, uh, I it's fine, you know. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You're kind of always on the clock, though. Clock, though. You know what I mean? It's like just you know when you only have like five minutes and stuff like. That, or if you got a day off, you know, in between, <laughs> in between gigs and stuff like, you know, you're always kind of like right. Well, I've still got to do all this. I've still got to do all that. I've still got to make sure that that gig's definitely going to be okay and, and you know, security. Yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. Right, but, it's just fine, you know. He's better and as well. Do you, do you sometimes so like in case the drummer couldn't make it, do you step in and so like play? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I've I've um oh, I mean, that's been like, for, see, for years because I, mean, I used to I used to um when I started Wild Wild and when I actually when Alex left and went on to uh, join uh, doing Doves and stuff like that, I ended up being Idlewild's drum tech, which basically wasn't really a drum tech. It was like setting drums up and put, putting them back down again and putting them in the van, right? Yeah, yeah. But I'd go and I'd be, I'd learn how to set up loads of different drummers, drum kits, like Arna from um, Monsters of Men. I'd set up his stuff for, you know, first year or something. And I'd, I'd know how he wanted to ever set up. And, um, but I never really got a chance to play the kit. You know, I never really did because, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I had to make it up and then to go and sound check it and then, you know, and then, and then that was that. But, I and mean, then when I came home, he set up my own drums. I was like, I have no idea how to set up my own kit. I don't know. I know how to set up that guy's kit and that guy's kit, but I don't know how to set mine up. You know, so I'd be sitting there changing everything. You know, spend most of the rehearsal changing things. You know what I mean? And rubbish. That's nice to play. <laughs> oh, it's uh, just incredible. I mean, all these things. But I've got to ask you: Do you have any drumming heroes? Yeah, I do. Nice. Yes. I think oh, really? there's a few of them, few of them like, uh, I mean, it's undeniable that Stuart Copeland is brilliant, you know what I mean? There's nobody like him. Well, Neil Peart, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> but I think, um, I guess, we get drumming heroes through the years. You know, when I started out, drumming, like Mel Gaynor for Simple Minds was a, was a massive, you know, he's, just, I mean, he was hitting those drums with sea trunks, man. It was just like, it was so heavy sounding. It was brilliant, yeah. really, really good. I mean, obviously, a lot is to do with like Steve Lily White's production as well, you know. But I mean, it was brilliant, you know, it sounded amazing. And then it was Dill from Big Flame, who basically, I was pretty convinced that I wasn't going to be a, a good drummer until I could play all of the Big Flame songs. So oh. I, was, I told Alan Brown about that. I didn't impress him. I think he was just I was just too too drunk and being a very like, fanboy. You know what I mean? Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so that conversation ended pretty quick, but but um, I so Delphi Big Flame, um, yeah, 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 massive, massive influence. And there's guys like, um, like currently, like, uh, well, I mean, obviously, Graham Bonner from Swerve Driver was a huge influence at that at the fame time, 
But um, oh, okay. there's Mac McNeely from uh, the Jesus Lizard, who and John Steiner from Helmet are just insane. Brian Taylor from uh, Mastodon. I mean, that guy's is so all the oh. time. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know yeah. how he does. It. <coughs> I really don't know how he does it, but he's, he's absolutely brilliant. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's pretty. You know, pretty much the the, the main the main guys. There's George Hurley as well. Let's not forget him. From uh, the Minutemen and Firehose, you know. You ever oh, heard? Okay. <laughs> I'm, so, like, I'm going to check out all these uh, like names. Oh, and oh like, man, there's loads. There's loads of great drummers that nobody talks about. Do you know what I mean? Dave Grohl, this Dave Grohl, that's just like well, that, Dave Grohl, yeah. Dave. You know, yeah, but, that's um, the thing about so like the reason why I want to do this as the drummer is because you know the band, you know the band's names, and you mm. know you know most of the singers. Aye. It's not really the, the drummers. And I was all like thinking. Oh, I'll so listen, I'll tell you one not. guy, tell you one guy you need to check out, right? Is a guy from Manchester called Mark Heron. Have you ever heard him? Mark Heron. Heron? But which band? He used to play in a band called the uh, Ocean Size. Oh no, no, I'm not uh Right. You're yeah. gonna have a lot of fun researching that one. Oh right, okay. Well, I'm gonna write it down, mark her, and then see if I, I can find him, him and track him down or something. Uh, he's, 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 um, I've never seen a drummer like him. You know what I mean? He's, he's yeah. absolutely great. You know, you got guys like, um, like uh, Craig, Craig Blundell from, like he used to be with Stephen Wilson, and now he's with Steve Hackett. And then you've got um, Gavin Harrison, that's with Porcupine Tree and stuff like. that. Mark Heron, as far oh. as I'm concerned, is just as good as any of those guys. But he's not a showboater. You know what I mean? He doesn't show off. He just plays really great. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's, he's great. You should, should check him out. He's, he's amazing. <laughs> and Phil Collins as well, obviously. I've got you know, while I'm on my, while I'm on my genesis. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got um, Trevor Palmer, who sort of like said that love Minutemen. Yeah. Minute? I mean, yeah, yeah, love yeah, it. Yeah, that's George Hurley's first band. Well, I don't think it's his first band, but that was the first time I heard uh, George Hurley. Um, and he, I, his drum is absolutely brilliant. Really, right. really good. I, I mean, they were a solid band, you know. Really yeah. good. Yeah. I'm really going to sort of like check them out, all these people that you've met. <laughs> yeah, this is really but... that you've, that you've not heard any of these bands. I'm actually quite jealous. <laughs> I've heard that they're not the bands, but it's all like not the drummers. So <laughs> I have to find out. Um, <laughs> Do you, like when we're talking about like drumming disasters, do you have any being you know, like being a really fast drummer? Mm -hmm. You must have so like maybe like with the drumsticks flying away or something. Or, well, I mean, like, I know that, you know, there was a couple of times. There was one time that I did a, a gig in uh, Perth with Dawson, and we were supporting um, the X actually, and it was it was brilliant. It was really good. But the real thing was that the stage was made up of these big cubes. You know, so the drum kit kept sort of disappearing into the stage. Uh, it was weird. Uh, I just felt I was getting lower and lower and lower, and it was just like this drum kit. <laughs> Where has everyone gone? It was just all splayed out everywhere. So that was a wee bit weird. Um, there was a gig, there was another one we played uh, in Leeds. What was the name of the place? We're supporting is it the Bridge Hell? Is it Bridge Hell? No, no, it was, it was about a million years ago. It was like supporting uh, Bomb Disneyland, I think it was, they were, they were called. So Stretch has turned up we were playing, right? And the guy was like, oh, you can use my drum kit, but don't touch anything. I'm like, how does that work? <laughs> then I walked up, right? And I was like, basically the guy, the guy's drum kit was absolutely massive, right? I only had like, I used a four piece. So he had like two bass drums, three rack toms, a floor tom, a snare tom in the middle, and a high out over there. So everything was all over the place. And I was like, I don't even know which one of these bass drums I'm really. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, this is totally weird. So I had to do this gig. Like playing instead of playing like that, it was like this, you know. And it was, it was like I don't know how we're going to get through this one, especially because everyone's been sort of fast, like you know. <laughs> you know? So I, that was about that was about weird. And um, there's one time I turned up to a gig in Edinburgh with everything. It was totally fine. We were about to go on stage, and I realised that I never actually brought any drumsticks. So it was, but luckily enough, there was it was um, I can't remember what it was somewhere in Wilkie House in Edinburgh, but they had all these um, programs like you know comedy. It was a comedy club that was on part of the festival, and um, yeah. they had all these kind of like programs like about that size, you know, just uh, magazines. So I had to roll them up and. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, well, luckily enough, it was just, it was a it was a uh, acid jazz band I was playing at the time, so I was just kind of shuffling away. So no, I mean, yeah, maybe that would just oh, what would just broke straight away, you know? I mean, turned into. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the perfect setup actually is Preston Pop. Do you know that uh, room, the main room? Aye, uh, aye. that's that's absolutely amazing because we can see you mm-hmm. and we can see Ali and we can see Jer, but you know you're not hidden. No, no, I need to get more symbols, so I'm kind of like, you know, just get eight <laughs> But uh, no, I thought that was a great week, like that. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, loads and loads of fun. Uh, I, but, you know, the, the weird thing about it, as I said earlier on, at the start of this, it was like, I never had a chance to get nervous about it, you know, because it was just like, in the van, out the van, on the stage, gig, you know, in that amount of time. You know, um, so I never had the chance to kind of like really like Whoa, better not be rubbish tonight. Better really get on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, didn't even yeah. chance to warm up and all that. You know, so um, but it was just adrenaline that goes goes through it, and the fact that you know you're looking out and there was like guys like Rodri, um, Alan Brown, Simon. You know, what I mean, uh, and it was just like all these people and well, people that were actually like look. I mean, obviously, first time I'd done a gig in two years, and I'm looking out yeah. and actually seeing people. What because I. I only see the backs of people's heads when I'm doing sound. When I'm actually on the stage playing, I see their faces. So you can actually kind of gauge how they're getting on, you know. So if they're <laughs> in the back, you know, then you're enjoying the gig, but you don't know what their face looks like. So when you're actually play, drumming away and looking up, it's quite nice to see how people are reacting. And I think, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I think it was quite good, you know. Well, I'm actually glad that I went to see you. And I have to say thank you to Neil Winward for it, because we were so, like, we got there early and we were talking and then um they said that the first band is going to be on but i didn't know who it's going to be but neil said why don't we just sort of like check it out so because like, i was talking, i was talking to the guys uh, uh the orchids guys because they were there as well aye, and then, aye. yes and uh neil said yeah come on we'll, we'll just check them out and i was like i was mesmerized because it's so incredible i mean i should i could have so like just done a video of you playing mm-hmm. but of course i got to sort of like get the whole band as well but it was just really mesmerizing the way you play the drums and i'm gonna say to everybody if you get a chance to see some shapes do please do go and see them because it, 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 it's just so amazing it's incredible um I'm, I'm really I, good. Thanks very much. I, mean, I mean obviously we, we don't play much um yeah. well you never Nobody tells you if you're any good or not, you know what I mean? So it's like, so it's, it's nice to hear that. I really appreciate that, you know. I mean, I, I've been doing this for quite a long time, um, and I've I've never really had a chance to kind of do much with it. But I'm actually starting to do um, sort of drum, drum lessons now as well. So I started kind of last year just teaching kids how to play drums, and it's really, really rewarding. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, the, the, my mate Howie, um, he's a bass player, he's a brilliant guy. He, yeah, yeah. he put me in touch with somebody and said, look, can you do drum lessons so I can get her an hour for, for her, her, her birthday? I was all right. Yeah. So the real lassie came in and she was the same age as as, uh, as my daughter as well. Is it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she'd never been on a kit before. And she just sat and we just kind of did a wee 4-4 and she was doing really well, really concentrating. And then I went out and I was like, look, you're getting a wee bit nervous now. Do you want me? Do you want, we will all leave and just, you can just go mental in the kit. She was like, ah, that'd yeah. be brilliant. So we went out and she was just going bonkers, do you know what I mean? And it was like, it was de- sounded like she was playing a cat and beef heart song or something like that, do you know what I mean? It was totally <laughs> wrong. But Heavy filmed it, he went in, because that's her uncle, he, he, he filmed it. And he, he sent me a copy of it and I, and I watched it. And she hit the drums perfectly in every place, the right place. And she was concentrating, she was kind of pivoting around the kit properly on the seat. And it was like, total natural, do you know what I mean? So even at that, it was like, this is great, just give somebody a wee chance to play. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's dead expensive now for kids. I mean, to, to, for anybody to go into a rehearsal room, it's like 30, 30 odd quid for three hours. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like, at, at best, do you know what I mean? And it's, I don't know, it's just a shame. Yeah. I, I was lucky when my dad bought me a drum kit, you know, and we had it on the drum, and had a very, very, um, very, very patient uh, mum yeah, and dad yeah. once. Do you know what I mean? So they were like, I just go for it, you know? So that was quite, quite good. So is that another thing that you're thinking of maybe doing professionally? So like yeah, a drum yeah, yeah. Or... Well, 
Yeah, I quite, I quite fancy it. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's just fun. You know what I mean? It's just like if, it's, it's rewarding to see. I mean, I'm not going to try and teach anybody to become Neil Pear because I'm kind of be Neil Pear myself. So, <laughs> you know, what I mean? um, but just like just get them in here. You know what I mean? And then they can move on and do other things like maybe more advanced drum teachers or whatnot. Or, you know, it gives yeah, me yeah. more ability to actually play more. You know, so I can get better. Do you know what I mean? So, so that's I, that's quite exciting actually. You know, it's pretty good actually. Try and use yeah. what what little skill I have to actually uh, maybe you know help myself out. Yeah, so <laughs> share it to the young people and oh, like, aye, aye. spread the well. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ian Ian Jackson said that some shapes blew my mind in Preston. Oh wow! So it, it's the same with me. I mean, I totally agree. I mean, it's like that. I was like that as well. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> well, the last question I'm going to ask you is: Do you have any advice to aspiring drummers out there? I mean, you're going to be teaching them anyway, so you, like, so any <laughs> advice? <to> <laughs> um, I just think just just go and play and have fun, and you know. Think of all your favourite songs, right? Uh, be it, you know, Foo Fighters, Led Zeppelin, Adele, I don't know. We I mean, don't know what kids are into, you know what I mean? Is what people are into. I mean, not everybody's, not everybody, my oh, glasses are on the aren't they? Look at that. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, I can't even see about them anyway, they are. But, um, <laughs> but I know, just, I mean, making a compilation tape up, you know, of like your favourite favorite, favorite uh, uh, songs that you'd like to Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, and just do that, and just play along with them with like that, and just um, find, find, find uh, your style, just find what you're comfortable with. But you know get I mean? the play them you. as fast as possible, like. I, I really, really <laughs> like, like so, like that they, they start in <laughs> times. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't believe that it's like an hour set, an hour set done in half an hour. <laughs> because you were so fast. I know. I know, I'm really bad like that. I know I should really kind of try and calm it down a wee bit. Do you know what I mean? So, also, don't drink when you're playing as well. Do you know what I mean? Don't do that. I don't. I don't oh, drink. Yeah. I don't drink that, when I'm doing the job. This is like I don't drink when I'm working. I don't drink when I'm playing. I'll drink later. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but um, but I, because you you need to, you need to be ready. Do you know what I mean? You need to be ready for like a stick dropping or you know you know like a symbol hanging like that when it should be like that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You basically have to kind of hear people. You have to hear the rest of the band, right? So your hearing goes a wee bit, and also your reactions go faster as well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So basically, just being as aware as you possibly can, and it's also kind of hang. And guitarists and bass players and keyboard players and all people wouldn't want like this, but you're holding it together. Do you know what I mean? So you kind of do it when you're a drunk guy. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Oh, thank you so much, Richie. I really well, enjoyed it. I'm so sorry I took up so much of your time. I said it was only going to be an hour, but it's actually so like me. Well, no, it's fine. I thought the official game's been cancelled today anyway, so I've got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to just say, look, Last words, final words to our uh, viewers. And yeah, well, oh, Johnny Gold said, "Good job, Richie." So he's he's sort of like, uh, "Well, thanks, Johnny." Uh, Cheers, Johnny. Yeah, Johnny Gold. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So, do you want to just say um, anything to our viewers and to our friends? Yeah, just Before. thanks for um, putting up with my terrible chat for the past one hour. <laughs> 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 I don't, I don't know what I was saying because I'm. Uh, it's um because of my very broad Glaswegian accent. A lot of people are just like, what? What was that? That was just a noise. I don't know what the guy's saying. <laughs> yeah, all the time, everywhere I can, I can go get misunderstood in any country in the world. Do you know what I mean? And I, and I'm speaking like hello. You know what I mean? They're like. I don't know what the guy's <laughs> so I know. Thanks. Thanks for them. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, Thanks for like giving drummers a bit of a platform to speak as well, because it's, oh, no, it's nice. I watched a few of them actually, and they've been, they've been great. You know what I mean? It's been really nice to hear how how other how other drummers work and what they yeah. do. Well, you know I, I mean? wish I could be a bit more technical though, but I can't. Well, no, you know <laughs> I'm what? more like no. just a fan. <laughs> well, you know what? This is this is better actually because like I think like the technical thing, like you see when you watch all these things on YouTube and all that. And it's just like, well, this is how you do it. And it's just like, it's all, oh, boring, you know what I mean? But it's <laughs> to find out what people are into. Do you know what I mean? 
I think I think it's <laughs> find out more about the person rather than do about like their technical ability because <laughs> that would be playing, do you know what I mean? So but no, thanks for this. This is great. I hope everybody's I hope, I hope it's been relatively informative. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Richie. I'm really so like grateful that you said yes to us the drama. So no worries. Thank oh, and so I said much. earlier on I've got a wee present for you as well. <gasps> I have to find it. I have to find it, but it's going to be pretty cool. So it's it, back at my mum's house. But it's, mm. Oh, thank you. I don't know when I'm going to see you next, but hopefully, hopefully soon. Yeah. Hopefully, Let's come go. to Manchester. Some shapes should do a gig in Manchester. I will definitely be there. I think it's a bit time. I think it's a bit yeah. time, don't you? Aye. Well, <laughs> yeah. I'll have a word with our board of directors and we'll see if we can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in Preston. I can go to Preston now. So it's <laughs> oh, okay, now. It's pretty cool. That's probably easier. Yeah. <laughs> He's a great um, man. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm really grateful. For, yeah, thanks for, a lot as well. And have a uh, great rest of the evening and a uh, great yeah. rest of the year. And yeah, happy new year. Happy new year, Richie. You too. Uh, See you. Bye. 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 Oh my God, I was so cool. <laughs> Guys, it's like nearly it's a, an hour and three quarters, <laughs> nearly as long as my chat with uh, David McCluskey of the Bluebells. They're just so 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 brilliant. This people from Glasgow. So, <laughs> but anyways, thank you so much for um, joining us live, and um, please do keep an eye out for um, the guest announcement for next week, and it's going to be another brilliant one. Not from Glasgow, but. Um, a drummer from crew that's that's the clue for for next week so thank you very very much and enjoy the rest of your weekend once again happy new year and remember love music love life and love 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 drummers they're just so awesome you've just seen richie there it's so amazing so let's see you all next week bye